Yeah, this thing says we can broadcast for eight hours, so I can't talk that long. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Jamie Sandoval, and I'm the founder of BioM. BioM has one mission in Rochester, and that's to create a biobusiness startup community. We think community is very important. Uh, we think that as, as businesses grow in Rochester, we're going to uh, need a strong community of people. Uh, to help foster biobusiness. So um, we have a lot of events. If you go to bioam.org slash events, you'll actually see all the events. We have three or four events every month to sort of bring together the community and promote what I call a lot of random collisions among people. Um, networking is key to what we do here. Um, this is the uh, Founder Series, which was an idea that I had about six months ago. Uh, because we are such a young community as far as, as, as bio-businesses that are coming out of Rochester, what I really wanted to do was bring in uh, people from other communities to actually tell their story in their own words of being an entrepreneur and being a founder and the journey it takes, um, probably the ups and downs as well. So uh, kind of give you an idea of, of what it's like uh, to be an entrepreneur in this journey that is exciting and terrifying. Um, we would like to thank our supporters. Uh, first and foremost, Life Science Denali for doing a fantastic job of providing the uh, food and drinks tonight, so we thank them for that. Uh, we also want to thank the Biobusiness Accelerator for hosting the event. Um, there's some amazing businesses that are coming out of, that are basically incubating in here right now. They're going to be amazing businesses, I think. Um, what else? Um, it was. It was through a couple of these random collisions that I actually ended up meeting Paul. Uh, the first one was at Mayo's uh, Transform Conference last year, where I was uh, fortunate enough to help facilitate a breakout session. And um, as the room kind of cleared out, and I was happy I was done with my session, and the pressure was off, I could enjoy the conference. Uh, actually, someone who turned out to be Paul's wife actually approached me and said, hi, uh, I want to get to know you. And I was like, why? And she said, well, you're the only one out of all of these bios that says the word genetics in the bio. And she said, you totally you have to meet my husband. And so I actually ended up skipping the next section of transform to actually sit down and talk with her. And she's an amazing individual. And she played Paula, like, just unbelievable. So then I started emailing with Paula at the transform. And we went back and forth a little bit. Um, and then it was a second sort of random collision when I went out to the Twin Cities to attend an event. Um, about six months ago, I think, um, that was uh, Seth Levine, who was the principal of the Foundry Group in Boulder, uh, gave a talk on startup communities up in the Twin Cities. And I was kind of doing what the thing I do when I walk into a room and kind of scan around looking for people I know. And I picked Paul up right away, because as you'll tell, he's pretty tall. But he kind of stood out in the crowd. So we struck up a conversation I knew as the Founder Series uh, went on that I would want to have Paul come down and give a talk here in Manchester. Um, so without further ado, we'll let Paul talk. Thanks, Jamie. I really appreciate you having me here. And uh, appreciate BioAM and the Accelerator for hosting this event. Uh, Jamie asked me to do this. Uh, I had not put together a presentation really process and what it's like to be a founder, and really my unique story. And I do think there are some, some very significant learnings of my experience. And as I continue to experience this process, that I, I believe will be valuable for, for any of you who like to move forward with starting a company, doing a startup. Not so much for the process as it is from a business standpoint, but more from a personal standpoint, the trials that you go through. In order for me to do that, I have to give you a little bit of background about myself. So bear with me as I go through a little bit of this to kind of explain who I am so I can tell my story and better understand who I am. So the words on the screen for me are the two most powerful words in my vocabulary. They are powerful in the fact that they set in motion a dream 
an ideal <coughs> vision for the future that you can see in, in, in Apple's case. And when you put a startup together, it usually starts with these two words. And no, I'm sorry, they're not these two words. Because I'm fired is, is not that powerful. Sorry, Mr. Trump. And if I could trade the market, I definitely would. It's, my, it's in my nature to do that thing. But it's free for everyone to use, but it also comes with a big cost. So if we take some examples of one of statements I, I tend to think that maybe some of the wonders of the world were created with the one of statement uh, and, and how powerful that was. I wonder who, who made the statement that created the pyramids or even what we've gotten, what has caused wars and, and given us freedoms in these types of what if statements are extremely powerful to drive change and opportunity not only just in business, but in personal life. And even for some of us who are left for punishment, you know, picks up the phone and the helpless frozen over. For us, for us who have dared to dream about the Vikings going to the Super Bowl. So I know that's dreaming really pretty big, but it's, it's a dream, right? So to explain to you where I came from, that is this really interesting decision in life. And it was at the end of high school, I had three unique directions. I could go to seminary, I could go to get a degree in computer science, or I could be a graphic designer. And they were very unique, uh, all different opportunities. And I won't get into the boring aspects of how that happened. But I would have tripled major. I, I would have, it would have been great. I don't know if there's a job title or an opportunity around that. But my 18-year-old self, my logic around that was really about the probability of, number one, what was going to be the best opportunity for me to meet girls. Number two, what was going to be the best opportunity to get to the cool parties. So you can probably guess that I went to med school, right? Um, <laughs> So I was a grad, I went to graphic design in high school to be graphic designer. And this is the essence, if I could put it down to one slide, whatever, it was the statement. And one of our professors said it uh, often. And, and this was a very loaded uh, statement I found out later on in my life. But it really meant in his way of teaching us how design works. Um, if it does not add, it subtracts. And I carried that with me professionally and personally and tried to apply that to different areas of my life. And I kind of think about it like pruning a bonsai tree uh, and trimming it. And the great satisfaction you get from envisioning something, building something by trimming it away and simplifying it and, and making something that's unique out of your head. And that's what building a startup is kind of like. You have this vision of the way the world could be, and you take time and care to prune it and to get it just right to match your vision. It doesn't always work that way, but it's a good illustration. And one of my favorite authors of that time the way I looked at design is, is, is very much in this quote, everything is design, everything. Paul Rand is uh, a somebody doubled up from a, from a teaching and mentorship standpoint, read all his books. But it's really hard not to see the world that way once you, once you think about it and how everything is designed, whether it's biology, whether it's product, uh, everything has design. And I had a really great early career doing graphic design and creative direction, and it all came to a screeching halt because of this guy. So I put up the iCard New York icon design for a reason. I had uh, entered a piece into a contest that was judged by Milton Blazer, someone I looked up to, and 
you basically said, oh, that's good. I like it. And I knew I had kind of reached the point at which I wasn't going to get much more ahead of Hit the level at which I was trying to attain success for a lot of other reasons. I said, OK, it's time to move on. So this is what I call life good. And there are these things that come together with opportunities where you kind of grab hold and, and bond with them. And the idea is, I think about it this way. I ask a lot of questions. I'm the annoying guy in the room at work that asks too many questions. And they get so tired of me that they say, go figure it out, Paul. I say, okay, give me a budget, I'll go figure it out. And instead of saying I don't know, uh, I, will, I will find out. And that's what kind of led me to this next transition, this problem that haunted me. It's, a, it's, it's part of, kind of my purpose in life to figure out what this question mark is in the center. It's the conversion of qualitative and quantitative data. Coming from my background in marketing, they're used for two, you know, they're used for similar things, different ways to gather them. Let's think of qualitative as gathering surveys, doing uh, interviews, things of that nature, much like we do in lean startup methodology. The quantitative, and they seem like they really should work together, provide the answer, fit together as a piece, but they really don't. And there's, there's a lot of complexity in that gray space in between the two data sets just not developing very well together. And I've come to this kind of working conclusion that, and it's really confounding, but we have walking contradictions, us as human beings. And I love people. And I think the reason why I continue to work on this is because people will tell me, I sometimes imagine, I look out into the room, and I make up stories in my head about Jamie, what is his lifestyle like? I, I, it's almost like stereotyping. And marketing is kind of like stereotyping. It's, it's, it's a legal way, an appropriate way of trying to guess about who you are as a person. And we use lots of data to do that. But what's really the paradox for the, the issue here is that we lie. We lie to ourselves and we lie to others. And sometimes we don't apply the step we're lying. And we're predictable, but yet we do things that are completely unpredictable at times. It's, it's very, very baffling, and it's confusing for a long time. And I think it's one of those problems you just try to figure out how to bring harmony to. And it kind of led me to, to this. I, mean, I don't know if you, any of you have worked in website analytics, but this is uh, a user flow from Google Analytics. And I spent years, years looking through data like this trying to pull out behaviors, uh, purchase uh, purchase habits, things of that nature, to try to optimize the way people experience websites and it moves on to mobile applications and things of that nature. And I look at this data and I see behaviors, I see people. And we move into the discussion topics Piece of focus groups anymore. We any topic under the sun. And it was at our fingertips, available to us in real time. Uh, I could see whether people preferred impressed pizza, deep dish pizza. I could do it by geography, just to see it on a day to day basis, trending. It, it's amazing, right? So it was a really awesome time in terms of uh, marketing, targeting, understanding people. And that's what I really love to do is understand people. And I really made up this term because I'm still not quite certain what that middle ground is. So I found this term called qualitative. And it's more of a joke out of my uncertainty of whether we're moving in the right direction. But it's, you know, it's, it's something to hold on to as we move forward. 
And it works because the whole ecosystem was built out of this. This is uh, it's probably updated now, right a year or two ago. Um, this is why I pulled on display advertising technology landscape. These are all the players of buying ads all the way to certain levels, and everybody involved. And it exists, it does well, it's billions and billions of dollars of business are served on trying to understand you as an individual and serve you the right type of recommendation pattern. These are all the people that are involved. And, and this is the business side of the world that I've been existing in my business for 15 some years, right? And one day, I was driving by this. I, I, I drive by the Walker Art Center on a, on a pretty consistent basis. And I don't know, has, has anybody been to the Walker? Have seen the sign? Right? I, I can't attribute the quote, and it really doesn't matter because I would see this, and one day it kind of clicked. And I read bits and pieces put together to present some list of a whole. Something came into my mind that I could not even see, and it changed everything. Right? This is the image that I saw. Right? So I look back. And all I saw is this, this Frankenstein. And I wondered to myself, is this how we see people through the lens of marketing? There's little bits and pieces of data that give this glimpse of what maybe sort of resembles human, but it's not really alive. So that therefore we don't treat you like a human. Right? I mean, is there an opportunity to make this better? That was kind of the insight, and I, I use this image a lot. I love the movie, but I love the story. But how can we do better? How can we stop, as marketers, stop looking at people as this kind of freakish thing that we think is sort of human? And that's when these opportunities take place, right? Right place, right time, right idea. And I was sitting at the time in my, my, my boss's office, uh, Dane Cartel, uh, and he encouraged me to submit a uh, proposal uh, to talk myself by self once. And I was like, sure. I mean, he was like, well, I really want to go to self by self once it's received better to get in, right? So I might a lot better pick something that's really interesting. And at the time, the trend was to talk about social network, social media, and to, let me let me think about this. I'll step back. I'm going to come back with a proposal and And that's when you know, we're disinvolved, right? When we're disinvolved, magic happens, right? It's usually several years, but in my case. And that's why I met uh, Dr. S Dr. Graham, who is in the audience today. And again, asking lots of questions, very simple questions. Dr. Farron-Crew, my trade geneticist, and it kind of led to this, this ongoing discussion. It led to saying, now yeah, I'll, I'll help you put together a presentation. We'll co-present, you know, self by self, unless we get accepted and it happened. And we put this really interesting presentation together, basically just this. This is the premise of it. What if genetic data was used for marketing? Boom. Wow. I went, I, I went in with no expect, expectations. Like, it makes sense to me. You were mining data from social networks, mining behavior, web analytics. Why are we mining this stuff? And I didn't know the answer. I was very naive, right? Uh, part of the bio business, I don't understand that is very new to it. But that question led to this the roller coaster, right? And we talk about this metaphor and founding a company, being part of a startup. And it's this problem is this crude, but it's, it's a really good descriptor of what this experience is like. And when it happens, 
you're in the middle of it, that happens very fast. It was a really awesome experience. But probably can remember how. And within like a week, started a company, filed IP, uh, published in Forbes magazine, like two days after just giving a presentation. I'm like, I have a product yet. You know, and you know, working on the pitch deck, you know, pitched our first VC, you know, my experience, I, you know, I tell the story and I won't give names, but you know, I guess my mantra now is go big or go home. So my first pitch ever for this company was a pitch to a VC in a place Sand Hill Road, Silicon Valley, and asked for like two and a half million dollars. Like, hey, we're on a good roll. I might say yes. Right? And it was a great experience. And if you know the answer was no, and you're gonna hear a lot of no's. You know, a ton of no's. And they're all learning experiences. Uh, we'll give you feedback. You use that feedback as a founder, you determine is that a valid feedback? Is this the right partner? You're feeling each other out. I mean, and they sometimes feel like hitting a brick wall. Like, what do you mean you're not going to give me several million dollars? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of the attitude to a certain degree that you should have. It's like you have the best idea in the world or the best product. In the world, right? You know, even if doubt exists, that's the attitude, right? Okay? And when you run into these, these barriers, and you run into a lot of them, that's just part of the game. It's, it's figuring out how to ask for help, right? And there is a huge community around you of people who have been entrepreneurs, are entrepreneurs, have done startups, uh, great advisors that you want to draw from. And I encourage you to reach out if you ever have a question. Uh, and Introductions are, are, are a great way to meeting people in the community asking for help. And the other analogy that I that I use for startups, and this is actually, I don't know if you guys ever play online online games, but this is a graph of, of time spent playing and gaming skill. These are a couple couple games that and the joke is basically the top game is, is really like, you know, why is this give up in life because it's so hard, right? I mean, like people are, 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 are having huge problems, right? And I'm like, sometimes I wonder, could I pick this startup right here? Right? Sometimes I feel this is my startup. And I think everybody feels that at a time. It, 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 there's lots of complications. And whether it's personal, financial, um, trying to trying to keep momentum, it's it's tough. And I'm gonna not lie to you, it's very tough, right? And that's definitely feels like my startup sometimes. So what do you do next? Continue to build up momentum. What we did is we got our advisory board together, got a couple of advisors in the crowd tonight. We got more press, so published and wired at MIT Technology Review. Started to sign out partners to help us build infrastructure, really focusing in on refining and testing the business model, and of course, finding your pitch deck. It's an ongoing pruning of that bonsai tree that I showed you earlier. And we had momentum. It was great, right? But every up, every up comes a down. Right? And sometimes it's like we'll throw you curveballs. Right? And sometimes at the, the most inopportune times, you're in the, moment, well, the middle of momentum that, like, I'm going to get through this last barrier, I'm going to get funding, and we're going to go. And what happened to me was the first curveball was actually two curveballs. So this is my daughter, Eve. Eve uh, is special in two ways. Number one, she was born. With a heart defect, she was going into heart failure at 24, uh, 24 hours old. Her heart was, I believe, three or four times the size of normal, and we spent four months in the hospital with her uh, until she got a valve of repair. So that wasn't really the detractor 
this time. She was diagnosed with a brain tumor at the age of four, which uh, really, as a parent, throws you out of your game. One of the reasons why I did this her was for my children, for my children's children, the way that I saw the future, wanted to hand that to them as the as their kids as well. So there's nothing more important than my children, and it really affects me and how I go through life if they're not doing well. So I think it, I can handle that. I've been through this before. And she flew to Florida, Boston, had the tumor removed, all is good. Back, of course. Right? Then, unfortunately, about more than a month and a half, two later, I lost my father prematurely to suicide. He was six years old. Uh, devastating effects on myself, my family. And there's not much more I can say that I haven't said in the past. Just that it's a very difficult thing to deal with uh, as an individual to reconcile those emotions. It just takes time. Right? And this isn't a whole, you know, woe is me moment. This is life. Like happens, right? And sometimes you want to wave the, the, the white flag and surrender. And I, I, I did. I was going to wave the white flag. I need time. I need time to think through this, to emotionally deal with this struggle. And what's amazing about going through these types of difficulties in life and this adversity is that you know how strong the team is around you, professionally, personally, things of that nature. I had phenomenal support around me. I was open and they were always there. And really, you know, because that those what ifs that were dreams, visions and aspirations at one point in time, they can turn on what if I had done this, what if I had done that? And self doubt remorse and other things can and guilt can, can take the table. And they and they do. This is part of life, right? But it, it passes, right? My favorite movie is Step Boat Society. Uh, this is Robin Williams. He asks the students to stand at the desk and look at things in a different perspective. And when you take those opportunities to look at life, shift your perspective you know, amazing things happen, right? And it did for me. It just took time. Now, this, this interesting aspect of startups, especially pre-revenue, you have no money, you're hoping to God you're not eating ramen noodles because they're horrible for you. Uh, but as a founder, you're supposed to see the forest, right? You're the visionary. Of course, but you're also building a product. So you're bouncing back and forth between I'm looking at the tree bar, can't see the forest, I'm trying to get the details done. And all I can tell you is bring in the support you need to handle some of those details so you can zoom up on occasion to make sure you're on the right course, you're in the right direction. Tree bar bad, forest good. So, how does that apply to where we're at today? And you guys may have had a little bit of a primer about who we are, and I'm not going to spend a lot of your time building a pitch or giving you our pitch deck. This is our model. It's very simple. Okay. We connect people with products and services and research firms. For their genetics. And we have an MVP that allows people to upload their genotype file and gives recommendations right now on 20 different traits. We can expand to, as, as more and more traits are researched, we may be researching them as well, but there are 20 traits. These are actual companies will look at their examples of companies, could be consumer package goods, with the trades range and, and everything from health uh, life 
satisfied. Dietary, exercise, behavioral. And if you're interested, I can share with you what we're looking at. Did you have advice for traits that are interesting to explore? We're at MVP phase, we're moving forward. We're, we, uh, we've acquired several members. We're going through a beta process right now. We're in the process of interviewing them, better understanding the value proposition, value exchange that we're finding, whether it's correct. And we're building out the storage infrastructure. So let's meet up in a nutshell. If you have, if you have more questions about it, you can definitely Ask me um, about some QA. Talk to me afterwards. I just kind of want to summarize this, this point and what we've kind of covered because this goes very fast. Startups, it's a roller coaster. I don't advise it for everyone. The ups and the downs are very high. They're heard us a lot like Texas Hold. They'll do it, right? Throw uh, yourself with people that will meet. Not people that are just there for a payday or file space, especially early on. People that believe in the same vision as you, that want to come along and share that vision. Draw a line in the sand. So, this specifically was something that I put as a rule. And it was probably my only rule as it related to this venture. And that was this. We hear about a lot of companies, startups that are founded by young individuals who really don't have healthy relationships or children or anything to lose, right? Is they've ever been thinking. I have a wife, I have three kids, I have a mortgage, I have you know all of the, the stuff that is American dream. And what am I not willing to lose in this process? And I've seen a lot of relationships marriages burn very quickly because the communication or just taking it too far. I know myself, I'm capable of taking it too far and to see the dream come to, to reality. So I made a, kind of a deal with my wife, you know, you know, just get to that point, please tell me, you know, maybe a little bit beforehand. I, I don't want to lose my relationship over this. Because what's the point? And then remind yourself and know. I mean, you can even remind yourself, but what is, what's your purpose for being? Not just your startup, but you. Why are you here? What is your goal in life? If you can answer that, you can do anything. And then the last thing I think that's most important is we're built to handle adversity. You know, my story is not that different than some other people I've, I've heard worse, right? And it's not always me to go through crappy times. And it sucks. And sometimes you eat crappy ramen noodles. Well, that's the worst that happens. But we are handled, we're built to handle adversity, and we bounce back, right? So don't give up. You think you've got something. That's about it. So, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Thank you. 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 down. you. Thank 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 we look at 23 years of Peter system. So uh, them slowing, if they have any, uh, they have any growth problems, but you know, we're feeding from not only just that, but other services as well. Uh, the broader FDA question, you know, I mean, we don't have any problems with that. So, and we uh, walk with you here and. Basically, it's about a revelation, you know, what it should have to do with the market. So, you had the concept, right? So, you had to start doing some research somewhere. What was the first 
break it because this wasn't, you know, this is a little bit discontinuous or a little bit of, you know, an idea about how I'm going to get this. Right. So somewhere along the line, as you said, okay, they were you know, pitching this and stuff. Right. And you've got a concept, and you've got some people after a few levels, after a few dozen levels, right. starting to uh, latch on to this. Yeah. Okay. But you, you know, there's this gap between what you're saying and essentially here it is. Right. Mm -hmm. So so you're you're interested kind of more in how do we how do we get from idea to MVP, right? There's something in between there. Like, you know, how do I validate? In a sense, I've had many experiences where I stumble on this. Right? It's sort of serendipitous okay, that I stumble onto a piece of technology or somebody says something, and the next thing that goes through my mind is, wow, you know what you could do with that? That's not the negative what can you do with it. Right. It's the positive. Right. It's like, wow, this could solve this problem X. Right. All right? And that sort of gave me, you know, not that I ever. Well, but at least it gave me sort of that little springboard. I need to pull in the thread. Okay. But when I listened to you, you didn't have that piece of technology. You sort of said, what if we could do this? You know, what if somehow we do it? So now you almost, I don't want to say reverse engineer, but in a certain sense, there is some reverse engineering that sort of said, okay, what, what pieces are lying around that might be what happened in this? Well, I, I think, so you ask a great question. There, at the time, was no technology, I guess, that we had domain over that said, you know, gave us an advantage. Uh, what I think was a fundamental problem in, in the, the way that we're tackling it differently, that genetic data as of this you know, today, uh, has been looked at as a tool for clinical usage. And that's it. Right? And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's great. So the question I had was, how do we grow this faster? Because if it's only useful when you're sick, I mean, we have a long way to go. And how do we get people to care? Until it's too late and I'm sick, right? And that's where we kind of shifted perspective. I mean, my background in marketing, other co-founders, genetics, other co-founders, data science, all have different perspectives that we're able to communicate a different path to, to the solution. And what was really missing was traction. So the problem was that at the time when we started this, it was really non-existent. It's like, uh, I don't have my genetic data, so I wouldn't come up. We're looking at it from the lens of it will be what ubiquitous. The question is, when will it be ubiquitous? And can we help make it ubiquitous? And everybody has access to this data. Because we've all seen the hockey stick graph on the, the reverse direction, right? You know it's going to be very cheap sooner than later. The question is, when? Hi. So the breakthrough for us was traction in other areas of the marketplace like 23 Me's Grow, right? And they went, when we started talking about this, they had 15,000 people in their database. They now have nearly 700,000, right? And it gives us an opportunity to test out our business model against the marketplace and see if our potential customer base has, can answer, has had that need. Because they're already they're already using personal data. Can we figure out a way to give you your data back and have you have more control over that as we move forward as a society? So I talk about the broader implications of privacy, identity, things of that nature, which are very important to me personally. You know, will, will be just part of our platform. But that's not the way the market is excited about. They don't understand these problems. That's important. Um, okay. 
connecting marketing with genetics. You know, they each have their own sort of ethical consideration. Can you speak at all about navigating the, the ethics landscape of making that connection? For instance, somebody finds out, you know, through genetic testing, they carry the BRCA gene, and, you know, how long until they start receiving coupons for, you know, mastectomy prospects? You know, it, it, it. Uh, well, number one, we, we've carefully selected the traits we're looking at. Yeah. So, RAP1 and RAP2 are not things we're looking at. Because we don't have a fundamental answer about how we feel about handling that. But ultimately, my perspective uh, is since you're data, you can do with it as you please. Whether you fully understand it or not is, is a whole different matter. And we've kind of seen that from research and doing interviews is that people don't understand probability very well, especially if it's not contextual, right? So I can look at something and say, you know, you've got a 0.2% greater risk. What does that mean? You know, I'm going to die tomorrow? Probably not, but depending on your your biases, some people will look at that and go, no big deal. Some people will go, maybe there's a big deal. But that's not that's not what I'm trying to solve. What I'm trying to solve is, uh, can we make this applicable, useful, on a daily basis? We make all these decisions every day that you can use this information to help make you, uh, help educate you and, and, and make those decisions easier, more clear. I'm not saying they'll make your life better, but I can't. That would be your life. But, you know, fundamentally, this is based out of you and your biases, right? You should be able to, to leverage those, make those important decisions. Great story. I, it's hard to summarize in like 30 slides, but I'm try. Two, uh, two questions. Is, is it part of the genetic record of the blood samples or slots? Slot, slot. Slot. Are you a drug? No. You're a drug. That's what you do. Where are you drawing the line in this? We can talk after. <laughs> Could you expand uh, into this study testing quality required in the trial? Is it a good enough quality and something like that? Right? Yeah, quality and versus, versus quality. Quantity, yeah. But you do have the new word there, right? Right. So, besides your own business, does that term would be used to put somewhere else else in other businesses also? That's a great question. I've not thought about that. A more technical question about um, collecting people's genetic data, like when they decide they want to give it to someone to take for a particular study or something. Or how do they get it back? Are there any other models similar where people like digital data where people have like, rights to something for a limited period of time and you make sure they come back? That seems to be a big type of thing. Something a lot. Why they accept it? Because you, eventually you feel like you have to trust the advisor you gave them your genetic data. Right. What am I going to get? You know, I'll sell it to you for this study, but if you want it for another study. <coughs> so it's like like it's like licensing, right? Yeah. It, it, it may be in the year So like we turned around on the companies and said they put it to your MR data. Right. License it. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, who is what's either copyright, creative commons, things of those nature in it? I think there's absolutely, you know, we see this industry built on open source, right? Building up data sets. And there's under the premise of uh, de identify this information, which is completely utter BS because we know we can pull that stuff back together with the right other data sets. And, and so the value of the data is not necessarily de identified, the value of the data is with identity, you know, what we think is really interesting is that. It's not just genetics, uh, but this environment, right? So how can we marry the two? And my background is in mining for behaviors through 
the environment and through conversations. And what if we can bring those two worlds together? And that's what we're trying to do to bring more value, right? Because it's saying it's just pure genetics, and we can build a model based on that, but the value is in my environment and bringing those two concepts together. It seems to me like what's really important for you is being able to connect those behaviors with that sequence, that genetic sequence. And then when you do that, like you say, you can get it. It makes me believe that anonymity actually existed in. Right? So all you can do is provide the best level of security for your data, right? And provide that, that platform in which you can see the value of that, right? That can become in the, the value of money or value of knowledge or savings, things of those nature, things that are for uniqueness, rarity, scarcity. Um, so on the, on, you asked the second question, which was, uh, from a research perspective, an interesting story. Uh, if you guys have a second, so as my daughter was in surgery at Boston Children's, uh, and we were in the waiting room for eight hours, the eight-hour session, right? And I was sitting with the research firm that came up to us. They they, they, they were very very kind, handed me a 25-page release, form. and my daughter's in the middle of brain surgery. I'm like. Really, you know, but I guess you know, I just probably know better now. And I read through every single page and started asking myself, you know, maybe I'm not okay with giving away all this information. Maybe I just want to do this, this, and this. And so my wife and I went through the form and we kind of talked about it and said, I'm okay with the tissue sample, I'm okay with this, but I'm not okay with, you know, Sequencing her and you having carte blanche over that, even though it's saying I can opt out at any time, I'm going to completely forget about this two weeks from now. And this is my data to give away. As a parent, maybe it is, right? It's caregiver. But, leave me speak. But as, as uh, you know, I don't know how that can come back uh, to her in the future. So, my thought was why does it have to be all or nothing? Why isn't there levels of, of consent? So that's something we'll be exploring too. Or further than that, or you just went back up the great thought that parts of your genome rather than the whole thing. So everything we're doing is fully opted at the trade level. Yes. So some other question. So you know the tips what you do when you are kind of like in the low side of the roller coaster as well as when you're seeing you know not the tweets, but you're just one. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what do you like? Uh, <laughs> pro tip, uh, don't stop. Uh, I, you know what's funny? I, I reach out to friends, advisors. You know, they're there. That's what they're there for. They do to give you encouragement. You get unstuck. But see things differently. I mean, even the best of us get stuck. It happens. Um, build a great advisory board. Have great friends. Reach out to them. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't ever be afraid to ask for help. I'm just wondering what industry do you think will be the first one for your, you know, commercialization? Is it pharma? Probably. Yeah, for consumer? Probably. You know, it's already happening. You know, I mean, uh, if I were to tell you what the first one is, I'd probably give away the first contract. Right? Uh, you know, I think the health and wellness space is important, right? You know, it's important to to this institution, you know, I mean, it's, it's how do we get in front of people who move away from the sick model to well model, right? And the question that I'm trying to answer is how far up that funnel are we gone? Is it at, you know, right now, it's, for me, it's an adult book, 18 years old. You know, some people push it even further. It's like, after sequence, here's what you do, here's what you don't do, here's the plan. I don't know, that's maybe the first thing we know. I'd like to have a say in that, but I think you know it's there's the wellness space is pretty broad. Diet, exercise, you know, even mental health, which is very important here and dear to me as well. You know, we have we have a crisis in this country and, and a shortage of mental health services. You know, what can we do to help people that need help? So maybe I can answer those questions. Do you have any controls 
in place say by the Center website. So uh, the hair care products that we have that came from the fall versus somebody else to do when we started going fall obviously. Um, to find out if you didn't use the genetic data but you just went by the environment that you got the same outcome. Where how are you going to measure the oh, right. over so, the yeah. natural way of We're experimenting with that. We've got a couple of different ways we we were applying testing and approaching that uh, just to make sure that people understand you know how we're making those decisions and recommendations. Yeah we have to be very careful about stepping over a certain line that has been kind of what we stand in terms of uh, processing and and giving diagnosis. You know what I, mean? um, I, I meant more of are you going to let the companies that you're selling the data do the control studies to find out if they can get any benefit from having right. marketing through genetic versus the we'll way provide, they are? We'll be providing them reports, so it's, it's very easy for us to see you know, the, way that they, the way that we report that data back to them. They'll be able to you know immediately put it down. It's, 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 uh, it's, or exceeds requirements for their existing marketing channels. Uh, so if they continue to buy, then it does. Right. So that'll be exciting. I and mean, that's going to be the day of reckoning. Right? Yes. People say, wow, that's a better return on my investment. Exactly. exactly. Well, I appreciate you guys. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, one thing I want to say uh, is we had a second reason for being tonight, and that was to celebrate uh, a group of people who uh, took a big risk recently. It was about three months ago when I actually attended a meeting inside Mayo uh, where they asked you know, to bring good ideas, and that was about it, and uh, ended up in this meeting, and they pitched us on the idea of a lean launch pad concept. And what they were doing was looking for teams um, that could, you know, sort of organically form, and then uh, go through this process as a pilot. Uh, and so uh, there was was it five or sixty? Six, six teams that were chosen out of like sixty or seventy teams, and uh, they, with their own money, uh, moved themselves out to San Francisco, uh, hung out for a week, and really learned this new launch pad process, and then came back, hit the ground running, and did almost 100, or in some cases more than 100 interviews, uh, trying to uh, take their idea and, and look at how they could make a minimal viable product out of that. And, um, and I think they've done a, a, an amazing job. They came back a couple of weeks ago and gave a presentation. Um, and I think my sort of entrepreneurial heart was just excited as all heck because after every one of their talks, they were asked if they were ready to go and was this going to be a company? And every single one said yes. And that was amazing. And, uh, and so we wanted to uh, recognize the people that were part of the Launchpad. If anybody was, stand up so I can a couple of them here tonight. So I want to have a round of applause for them. All about taking risks, and they took some amazing risks. And hopefully, uh, based on what I've heard and seen, they're going to be amazing. So uh, we wanted to welcome them to the BioAM community, get them involved, and uh, now we get to the fun part of BioAM, which is the end. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually the networking. So feel free to hang out. There's tons of pizza left. There's tons of beer, I hope. Uh, and just kind of get to know each other, make some random collisions, and thanks everybody for coming. <laughs> Also working in a bio. Okay. So, uh,